Well, welcome to this video. Now, I was going to report on this new vitamin D clinical trial. Yes, that's right, vitamin D clinical trial, uh, along with some news today. But I started prepping it, and it's such an important data set, such an important result. I've decided to do the whole episode on that. So to give you the bottom line is the first randomized blind controlled trial on vitamin D as an interventive therapeutic in poorly people has been published and the results are more positive than I could have imagined. That's the bottom line of this video. Now, what this really makes me think about is I've been talking about this since January. Many reputable scientists have been talking about this, but governments and agencies seem to have been putting it down. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but you know th th this stuff's readily available and it's cheap. And um, it really isn't a problem. When, when I say cheap, you know, we can manufacture this or pharmaceutical manufacturers can manufacture this for essentially nothing. And yet more expensive drugs are being used. What's going on here? Why has there been no organised clinical trial by the World Health Organisation, the Oxford Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine, the Centres for Disease Control? There's so much evidence now for vitamin D. Why is this not being done? It really is quite strange. Now, um, enough speculation. Let's dive straight into the facts. Now, just by way of background, as we've looked at many times on this on this programme, uh, this is data from Healthline, uh, readily available. Click on that. I did it this morning. It takes you straight through. And we see that 42% of the population is deficient in vitamin D in the United States. But in certain ethnic groups, this raises dramatically. And of course, these are the groups from memory that have 4.7 times higher death rate than the uh, European descent population group. So vitamin D deficiency very prevalent in the United States. And we could spend the whole video giving information from other countries. That would show very similar results. Now, just to give you an example, this was published on the 3rd of September. This is not the main study, but there's so much of this sort of studies now. So many like this. I'm just going to give this this as a quick example. 3rd of September. Uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, reputable stuff, based in Chicago, Association of Vitamin D Status and Other Clinical Characteristics with covid 19 test results. So what this group did was they um, they took people who'd had vitamin D tests in the year before and worked out whether they were deficient or not. And then when they came into hospital and tested positive for COVID-19, they did a correlation study on it to see if there was any, uh, any difference between those that were deficient in vitamin D and those that were not deficient in vitamin D in the results taken in the past year. So in other words, these were patients that they already had vitamin D status data on. So yeah, very, very sensible approach. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, they got a cohort of 489. So in, in this hospital, it's a single centre study. It's not a perfect study. So they happened for the people that were admitted, there was way more admitted with COVID-19 than that, obviously. But they had vitamin D status on 489 of those people. So patients who had vitamin D leveled in the year before, so the year before COVID-19 testing, before people tested positive for COVID-19. And the relative risk of testing positive for COVID-19 was 1.77 times if you were deficient in vitamin D. So people that took, people that were short of vitamin D in the previous year weren't twice as likely to get COVID-19 or be diagnosed with COVID-19, but they were 1.77 times. Now, if there'd been no difference, that would have been one. So 1.77 times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19 if they were vitamin D deficient in the past year. Not a clinical trial, but pretty impressive. Now, this is not so much people that are tested positive for COVID-19, remember. This is people that have tested positive for COVID-19 having come in to a hospital facility. So these were the people that were more poorly so what we can actually say is there's a 1.77 times 1.77 greater times chance of being admitted <clears throat> if you're vitamin D deficient and receiving a positive uh, COVID-19 diagnosis. Now, I, I could have quoted many, many, many similar studies. I've just quoted that one because it's the most recent one I could find. Perfectly legitimate uh, correlation observational study. But of course, we need clinical trials to be definitive. The World Health Organization has been going on and on and on 
about the need for clinical trials quite, quite rightly, but it has not organised a clinical trial on vitamin D status and infection, let alone COVID-19 status. It really begs the question, why not? And I would love someone from the World Health Organization to get into uh, contact with me and, uh, and tell me why not. I, I just, or the Centres for Oxford, Oxford Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine or the Centres for Disease Control. Just why isn't this being done? It, it just, um, you sense my frustration. Um, this is the trial. Um, published, it's work done in Spain, published in the Journal of Steroid Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Um, reputable journal. Um, not everyone's heard of it, but uh, quite a lot of stuff's published there. Uh, therapy versus best available treatment. Right, so, so what they did was they had people coming into this study in Spain and one group, they gave them the current best available treatment as per their hospital protocols. The other group, they gave them the best possible treatment as per their hospital protocols plus additional vitamin D or a form of vitamin D as we'll see. So it's quite simple, standard treatment <clears throat> without vitamin D, standard treatment with additional vitamin D. Now surprisingly this is done in Spain which of course I mean you know most of us in England or wherever go to Spain to get a suntan but in these parts of Spain <clears throat> it's not really cultural to, to go in the sun so people Surprisingly enough, in these areas are relatively vitamin D deficient. Surprising, but, but true. Right, let's dive straight into it. Um, the objective of the study, uh, does vitamin D decrease acute respiratory distress syndrome, which of course is the filling up of the alveoli with the inflammatory fluid so people can't breathe, as you know the acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is the inflammatory complication that kills most people in COVID-19. And what they wanted to test for was the effect of calcifidiol, calcifidiol, calcifidiol. Now, calcifidiol is the same as uh, 25 uh, vitamin D, is the same as uh, 25 hydroxyvitamin D. Now, what this is, what this calcifidiol is, it's a drug, we use it regularly for other conditions. It's a vitamin D analog. Now, when you take vitamin D tablets or the skin makes vitamin D, it makes it in this form of calcifidiol. But this is not the active form. It has to go to the liver to be activated into this 25 hydroxyvitamin D. Then this 25 hydroxyvitamin D has to go to the uh, has to go to the kidneys after that to be further activated into the active form, which I think is 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol from memory but don't quote me on that anyway so there's these stages of metabolism now the point is if you take vitamin d tablets so when i take these vitamin d tablets here if i take one of those today it's going to take a few days for my liver to metabolize that especially if it's a large dose it's going to take a few days for my liver to metabolize that into the active form in the blood so what this group is doing is they're giving it as the active form so this uh, calcifidiol is the active form. It's already activated. So it cuts out the liver stage of activation. In other words, it increases the 25 hydroxyvitamin D levels almost straight away. It's got virtually 100% absorption from the gut. It's just given orally and they go up straight away. Whereas if you give me a handful of these, um, my vitamin D levels will go up, but it's going to take time. And of course, these people were already acutely ill. So they gave this vitamin D analogue. You've got exactly the same effect of increased blood levels if you're given this in higher doses the week before. But of course, these people didn't know the week before they were going to get critically ill. The, the, the uh, implications for prevention, though, are, are of course, obvious. Um, so um, the, the outcomes, so, so they, they gave this uh, calcifidiol because it would rapidly increase the 25 uh, hydroxyvitamin D concentrations in the blood so the blood levels will go up quickly so instead of the blood levels imagine that's blood levels there that's the blood and the, that's the plasma levels and this is a, this is, this is a week's time so that's days one two three four five six seven days so normally if you give the vitamin d the level will go up slowly like that 
But if you give it in this form of uh, calc if you dial, the, the level will go up really quite quickly like that. So that's the, the aim, to get the rapid therapeutic plasma concentrations quickly. It makes perfect sense. But it's still vitamin D. It's a vitamin D analogue. It's not some clever different drug. Uh, the outcomes are intensive care unit admission and mortality. And there were Spanish patients, of course, because it was conducted in Spain. And they were hospitalised. So these patients were hospitalised. When they were admitted to hospital, they were given the, uh, the, 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 the dose of this vitamin D analogue. They were given this dose of, I get my names mixed up with this, complicated, uh, calcifidiol. They were given the calcifidiol straight away as soon as they were hospitalised. And the question is, if they were given that as soon as they were hospitalised, would that reduce their chances of deteriorating to the point where they had to go into intensive care? Would that reduce their chances of deteriorating to the point where they would die? That is what this study is about. And they compared it with a group that were not given the vitamin D. An allocation into each group was randomised. This is a proper clinical trial. This is exactly what we need. So it's a parallel pilot. So they admit it's a pilot study because the numbers weren't very large, but it was randomised. It was double mass. That means double blind. And it's a clinical trial. So the patients came in, they were recruited into the trial, and then they were allocated into the vitamin D group or the non-vitamin D group. It's uh, and, and then they, they saw the results from that with the vitamin D. All the other treatments were the same. Well, the results from that. And then they could compare these two sets of results. And that is, of course, is the basis of a clinical trial, as you know. So the setting was a university hospital in, in uh, Corbino in Spain. Participants. Now, the numbers were small. 76 consecutive patients hospitalised with COVID-19 infection who came into hospital. Relatively small number, but we'll see the data is significant. And with this level of clinical trial, this they make their point very convincingly, as we'll see. Um, clinical picture of acute respiratory infection. So people came in with acute respiratory infection as a complication of COVID-19. Confirmed by radiographic patterns of viral pneumonia, which, of course, as we would expect with COVID-19, uh, infection, viral pneumonia, because it is a virus. It does cause pneumonia, of course, which is inflammation and infection at the level of the alveoli. All patients received a positive diagnosis. So, so far, so thorough. Uh, the procedure, all hospitalised patients received best available therapy. Now, this is the ethical point about this. This was done ethically in guidance with the, I think it's the Helsinki principles that describe how to do this. So it's not that the one patients were treated and one, one group of patients were treated and one group were not treated, not at all. They gave, gave the patients the best available treatment. It's just that some got this extra uh, calcifidiol as well, this vitamin D analogue that raises the blood levels very quickly on admission to hospital. Now, <clears throat> they were allocated two to one. So twice as many people went into the calcifidiol. So they ended up with about 50 people in the calcifidiol versus about 25 people in the control group. Um, not huge numbers, but the, the evidence is, is quite compelling, actually. And they were given oral uh, calcifidiol um, on admission. If they were given it, they were given 0 0.532 milligrams, which, of course, is 532 micrograms. And remember, my vitamin D here is uh, 25 micrograms. So we can see that they were given about 20, the equivalent of about 20 of these tablets. So a fairly substantial dose. Um, <clears throat> and then they were given um, another uh, 266 micrograms, 0.266 of a milligram on days three and day seven. And then they were given that amount, the, two point, uh, the 266 micrograms, the 0.266 milligrams, they were given that weekly until discharge. Um, and the endpoints were intensive care admission. Did these people require intensive care admission or were there deaths? Now, get ready for these results because they are, I must say, <clears throat> when I read them, I was, I was taken aback. 50 patients treated with uh, calcifidiol. Good. 
one required admission to intensive care, that's 2%. Normally you would be looking at many more than that. 26 untreated patients, sorry it wasn't 25, it was 26 untreated patients in the control group, 13 required admission to intensive care, 50%. So would you like a 2% chance of being admitted to intensive care? Or would you like a 50% chance of being admitted to intensive care? I know which I'd choose. Impressive difference. Now, even though the numbers were small, this gives a very high p-value. <clears throat> so I always forget these, but 0, 0, 0.1 would be 10% um, result of the chance that it rose by chance. 0, 0, 0, 0.1 would be um, 0, 0, 1 would be 1 in 100, and 0 0.001 would be 1 in 1,000. So in other words, there's only one chance in 1,000 that this result arose by chance. So pretty impressive data. In other words, to put it another way, they were 999 out of 1,000 sure this was a genuine difference. This is an impressive level of certainty. One, one chance in, in a thousand that it wasn't a genuine result. Of the patients treated with colic alcohol, none died. None died. And all were discharged without complications. I mean, wow. Wow. These are people that were admitted because they were sick. And they were all discharged. None died. No complications. Now, of the patients that were not treated, only two died. But remember, that was after they'd been admitted to intensive care. So um, these patients were admitted to intensive care. Many more were admitted to intensive care. What were the numbers again? It was, was it, I can't quite remember now. Um, any, anyway, many more, it's up there. Look, many more are admitted to intensive care. So I'm always doing that. I'm looking for the data I want and it's on the same piece of paper. So... 2% were admitted to intensive care who had the vitamin D, 50% without. But because the intensive care facilities were good, only two of these patients uh, died. Uh, so in, in other words, 11 were discharged, which is, of course is a uh, significant complement to the quality of intensive care that they received in this particular Spanish unit because normally you'd expect a much higher proportion of those that were admitted to intensive care uh, to die than two out of 13. But the point is um, only one, two percent required admission to intensive care in the first place in the group that were treated. Right, the conclusion. Now, calcifidiol seems to be able to reduce severity of disease and all but obliterates the likelihood of going into intensive care. Now they admit this is a pilot study, larger trials are needed. Now if you actually read this study, and of course I've given you the link to it there, if you actually read this study, it is a, a very, very well conducted study. Uh, everything was done properly as far as I can see, and the statistical analysis was, uh, was excellent. And that they even though the allocation to the two groups of patients was random, they actually went back to check that using mathematical models and were able to make adjustments because of the small sample size and they worked it all out very precisely. So there you go. That's that result. That's just look at it again. That the patients who were treated with vitamin D on admission to hospital, two percent of them went on to require intensive care. Patients that were not treated with vitamin D on admission to hospital, 50% on were went on to uh, require intensive care, but they were all treated with a uh, calcifidiol to increase the blood levels quickly. Quite impressive. And given that we have data like this, which we've suspected for a long time, really, I mean, it's just unbelievable that the World Health Organization and all these other centres we've mentioned aren't doing large-scale clinical trials on this. This is readily available. It costs nothing. And yet, it's, it's not being done. And more expensive alternatives are often being used. It really is hard to explain. 
Now, they do give rationales, uh, the, the activity of vitamin D receptors. So the, the rationale, why is this working? Why is this working? Well, there's these vitamin D receptors, vitamin D receptors, signaling pathways. So the vitamin D links onto a receptor and that starts off a load of uh, internal changes inside the cell. And that leads to reduced uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. It reduces the cytokine uh, chemokine storm, which causes the inflammation. Uh, all these things are all what they believe is happening. It regulates the renin-angiotensin system. Because, of course, you remember this is involved, it's related to blood pressure and it's related to the, um, it's, it's the ACE2, the, the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor via which the virus gets into the cell. Uh, it's modulating neutrophil activity, uh, increasing it when necessary, decreasing it when not necessary. It's maintaining the integrity of the pulmonary epithelial barrier. So what, what that means is it's, um, it's making sure that the capillaries in the lungs are not leaky so rather than having gaps rather than having um rather than having gaps between the cells as a result of inflammation the the, the cells that are um rather than having these gaps in the cells that are forming the pulmonary capillaries as a result of inflammation because normally when there's inflammation the the capillaries dilate and that means there's gaps and fluid can get out through these gaps and that fluid can fill up the alveoli but they're, they're postulating here that it keeps these gaps tight so the fluid can't get through, which again makes perfect physiological sense. Um, stimulating epithelial repair, both in the alveoli and in the blood vessels, and tapering down the increased coagulability, because we know that the increased coagulability of the blood with the formation of microthrombi is a significant risk in severe inflammatory COVID-19 disease. So there you go, I'm convinced. I would much rather have a 2% chance of being admitted to intensive care than a 50% chance. And of course, in the group that were given the, the vitamin D analog, no patients died, all discharged without uh, complication. And I personally consider it unethical that clinical trials are not carried out. Now, the, um, the, the patients in this study were given hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, that was the Spanish protocol, but that was the same in both groups. But both groups were given that. Both groups were giving antibiotics uh, if they needed it for bacterial secondary infection. So, so that's their protocol. Separate videos, we've argued about that. Um, but this one is, in my view, um, the, the, the evidence now is so strong, I believe it is unethical not to carry out full clinical trials. And I will call on the Oxford Centre uh, for Evidence-Based Medicine, uh, the nice organisations, governments around the world, Centres for Disease Control, um, World Health Organisation, to make clinical trials of uh, vitamin D and vitamin D analogues a priority because I believe this could save millions of lives as I said back in January as I've been saying every month since there we go right that's the end of that video um, I expect your experience frustration with me now yesterday we talked about uh, ventilation the, the just the importance of opening the windows getting the through draft because we pointed out in many shops and other places that we've got lots and lots of uh, mask wearing, perspex screens, physical distancing, hand sanitizing, <clears throat> all, all the things that we would expect, but very often it's done in a stuffy environment. So I said, uh, make, make me up, a, I asked people to make me up a bit of a poem. So uh, <laughs> this has now been done. Um, well, rhymes and things like that. So let's go through a through. Because we like our trustworthy sayings on this channel, as you'll remember if you've watched it for any period of time. Um, uh, to ventilate or ventilator, that is the question. It's quite a good one. Uh, Covid hates when we ventilate. It's no debate, just ventilate. Uh, don't hesitate to ventilate. Keep the virus low, let the fresh air flow. Ventilation to save the nation. Uh, don't be daft, make a draft. 
vent to prevent. Oh, very good. I'm no good. I'm useless at thinking up this kind of stuff. Lots of people seem to be really good at it. Uh, if you care, get fresh air. Ventilate to eradicate. Ventilate and you'll feel great. Ventilate before it's too late. Um, don't let the rascal infiltrate. Throw windows right wide and ventilate. <clears throat> Good. Don't tempt fate. You need to ventilate. No debate. You need to ventilate to cut the death rate. It's very good. Uh, ventilate. Don't contaminate. Don't leave it too late to ventilate. Ventilation is the key to get this country virus free. <clears throat> How about ventilate to mitigate? Good. Excellent. Now, um, one last thing. Thing. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Jackie. Who lives in uh, Ontario, Canada. Now, Jackie has written us a little poem. Where am I? I'm getting confused with my screens here. There we go. So there's a little poem. Now, uh, I'm not going to do it out because I'm not a rapper or a poet. I'm not going to read it out. But I'm going to put it in the description. So if someone wants to, um, whatever you do these days, do you rap it these days? I've no idea. Or set it to music or something. Then it's there. And if you want to send me that, I would love to play it online rather than me make a complete mess of uh, Jackie's poem. But thank you for that, Jackie. Excellent. Um, these things appear a bit silly, but actually... Uh, anything that communicates is absolutely fine by me. So there we have it. The evidence has been accumulating on the efficacy of vitamin D in prevention and prevention of uh, deterioration. We know it's an important immunological molecule. We know it's been pretty well ignored by the powers that be, despite the amount of literature in terms of peer-reviewed observational studies in terms of peer-reviewed correlation studies now in terms of a peer-reviewed randomized blind controlled trial we just need a bigger one then we could be absolutely definitive about this and in my view it's unethical that this is not being done so thank you for watching as always <laughs>